Think you know the Brooks Ghost? Think again. Introducing the all-new, better-than-ever Ghost 16. Now with nitrogen-infused cushioning for lightweight, supreme softness that feels good every step, every street, every single day. So go ahead, take your daily joyride in the all-new nitrogen-infused Ghost 16. It'll turn your everyday miles into everyday endorphins. Let's run there. Head to brooksrunning.com to learn more. Empire. Hey, baby. Hey, baby. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. Go O's, everyone. Hi, everyone. Go O's. What's up? What's going on? Not much. Why do you have? Why do you now have an O's baseball in your background? I don't know. It's a good question. <laughs> I have no oh, idea. I just right. found it, and I'm like, now I'm playing with it. I don't know what to do with it. Look at that. Uh, it could be. You know, it's on the other side, the other station. Whoops! Don't whoa, look at quick. Don't look at quick. <laughs> yikes! Yeah, yikes! Yikes is right. Uh, what's up, Calla? What's going on? Uh, not much. You showed that Orioles ball, and they got walked off by the Mets uh, yesterday again. So again. panic! Everyone panic! <laughs> Did you see the uh, the way the dude reacted after doing the walk off? He was pumped. Yes. Yes, yes, that was. Did you uh, see the tweet from the Orioles where they called them the New York Mess? Did you see that? No, I didn't see yeah. that. <laughs> well, one, uh, it was old pal Jesse Winker who used to play for the Nats. The Nats traded him to the Mets, so that kind of sucks. And then the other side of that, did you see what the Mets put on the scoreboard after no. they walked him off? No, they put up that that uh, screen grab from the wire that said, we want you to put the word that word that we're back up. And that's just, that was just sitting there the whole, whole entire time. Like people were gone for a long time. They just left it up there on the scoreboard. So oh, the right. Mets got cocky by beating the Orioles. That's the so world. The Mets we live in. and the O's hate each other. Okay. Who knew? Yeah. A little weird, a little weird. Yeah. Who knew? Who knew? Yeah. Uh, so uh, yesterday I went back out to practice again. And I'm here to report something to everybody now. And it's the first Whoa. time I can say this. I got here to report something now. It's time to get us all out of there. <laughs> because for the first time, I actually felt like I watched something real. And I'm not going to say formations because I don't feel like getting calls from DQ or Sean or anybody about it. But it was open to all of the media. If it wasn't, I wouldn't say anything about it. But it was. And I was standing there going, huh, okay, we're going to do a little bit of that now, are we? Okay, all right. Like, we did a very cool wheel route to Austin Eckler behind a specific block of a specific receiver. And then they had this, like, power look where it was, a you know, like, definitively a run until it wasn't play action throw to Bates over the middle. I was like, okay. And I'm just sitting there, I'm looking over at the coaches going, yeah, it's time to shut this thing down, guys. <laughs> right? Shut it down. You've gone the whole summer without showing us anything. It's time to shut the whole thing down. Let's get out. Because I know you're not showing us anything Sunday night. So let, let's, why don't we just close the doors a little early here? Because I think you forgot we're still standing on the sideline. Time to shut it down. Wow, look at, look at how things change. You're full let Cliff cook over there. I'm going to let Cliff cook. I like uh, what's going on over there. I'm going to bring, bring up something in a minute because... Ben tweeted out this uh, piece from, you know, one of these football writers, and it's going to go down for me as one of those, this person has no idea what they're talking about tweets in a minute because it has no context whatsoever. This person probably hasn't been to one single practice or listened to one single thing the coaches have said. And because of that, he made conclusions about things that he saw in preseason games and decided nothing's changed around here with Kingsbury and that's why I'm saying time to shut everybody out. It's, yeah. it's time for everybody to go. They forgot we were still there today. They just had to make it two more days. That's all they had to do is make it two more days. And then they can run whatever they're going to run. But I like, I saw the real stuff today and I'm like, okay, you know, whether it works or not, I don't know, but I'm just like, saw the real stuff. Today. Sure. Sure. Okay. I mean, that's, that's, I guess good to know. Uh, I'm with you. I would have rather just not known that was happening. Uh, right. I would have rather had to just save that for another week, but okay. I mean, they got yeah. practice it, I guess. So yes, whatever. we got it in. All right. So let me show you this. 
be interested to see this one. This one came, uh, Ben Standing tweeted this. It's just from this guy, uh, Ian. And I believe Ian is either fantasy or pro football focus, something like that. Like a legitimate person on the internet who follows football. And he puts this list of notes that he's seen from Cliff Kingsbury so far. And he said this, the Cliff Kingsbury experience has been on full display through eight quarters of preseason action. Number one receiver, Terry McLaurin is lined up as the offense is left outside receiver on 28 of his 29 snaps. That sort of stationary alignment was commonplace for DeAndre Hopkins when he played for Kingsbury in Arizona. And, um, and then at least he had admitted at a, at a later point in this, he goes, by the way, when Hopkins played a lot, he actually had incredible stats out of this position, but that's, that's besides the point right now. Then he said, also known for featuring a quick pace, league high 34%, no huddle rate with the Cardinals. Washington has a ridiculous no huddle rate of 56.7% at the moment. The Steelers are in second place, 13%. Washington currently ranks dead last in shift motion rate, 10.6, and 31st in play action rate, 15.6. Two metrics that, again, Kingsbury ranked lowly, 32nd and 16th during his time with the Cardinals. Only the Eagles, 22.8%, and Panthers, 22.2% have run a higher percentage of snaps featuring a pass run option than the commanders, 22%. Cliff's Arizona offense is ranked third. Okay. <laughs> okay. This, if you read this and you look at this, your immediate reaction to this would be, he's changed nothing. He's predictable. It's going to be the same thing. I used to remember, we used to talk about him a lot when he was in Arizona and I'd say, are they too predictable? What happens when we get to December with them? And all of a sudden their offense wasn't cooking like it used to cook. And then there became this argument of, are they not adjusting under him? Or is Kyler not capable of adjusting along with it? It became that kind of argument here. And I read this and I go, okay, let me take this point by point for a moment. And let me start with the McLaurin one. I know that he's not going to be stationary in the same position all the time. And the reason why I know that is McLaurin has told us that. And Quinn has told us that I'm not saying anything that isn't public. McLaurin has told us that. So Ian, is it possible that they're not showing you what they're going to do with him at this point? He's already said he's not going to be utilized that way exclusively this year at all. Yeah, I mean, that could go for most of these points. We, This is preseason. No one shows anything that's real. And in fact, it's very vanilla in general. Why would they show anything? Correct. I, I, like, this isn't the time to be worried is what I'm getting at here. I'm no. not saying these trends might not happen, but you can't base anything off preseason play calling. Like, no way. No. Okay, here's point two. Always known for featuring a quick pace offense, 34.6% no huddle rate with the Cardinals. Washington has a ridiculous no huddle rate of 56.7 at the moment through the two games. The Steelers are at 13%. Um, so most teams around the league aren't showing a up-tempo offense because they don't want you to see what they're going to do with an up-tempo offense. But if you listen to Dan Quinn last week, who held press conferences about this, he said openly we're doing that on purpose because we need to run the offense this way. We need to have a practice game running up tempo. It doesn't mean that we're going to be up tempo constantly. We just feel like we have to do it. And it wasn't just Daniels doing it. It was Driscoll too. The entire first half, I think they maybe huddled up once or twice the whole time. But I knew going in, it was being done on purpose. They decided. This is what they wanted to do with their offense. This is what they wanted to showcase. So Ian, again, when you write something like that, you're making a suggestion that you're seeing something that isn't true. This is what they said they were going to do on purpose for a purpose and without any regard for what their offense is going to be in a couple of weeks. Right. I, I mean, once again, this also even goes into – practice tendencies you don't know what players are being asked to do on a play-to-play -play basis Correct. or a certain day of practice they might be working on 
X, Y, or Z that might make A, B, or C look terrible that day as well. The same correlation happens in the preseason. So another thing that Quinn's talked a lot about throughout the preseason is he wants to make sure everybody is communicating properly, that everybody's on the same page. And the only way to do that is to speed things up. He talks about it a lot on defense. He goes, I'll know they're ready when I hear them before I see them play. With the offense, one of the priorities of this past week was to try to go up-tempo to see how they function as a unit. Would there be pre-snap penalties? Would they not be on the same page? Would they have to burn timeouts? Could Kingsbury get the calls in when they have to quickly? How does Jaden deal with it when we're just forcing him to be this way throughout the entire time that he played? Ian, (laughs) had you paid attention to what they were doing? Because the way it's written, not not that I think this particular report carries a tremendous amount of weight, but then once Ben tweeted it for our fan base, I go... They're going to read this and they're going to think that things aren't being done in a way that would either hide what they're going to do, or it's going to be tendencies that Kingsbury brought with them from Arizona. And they're not going to be, and they're not going to have this element of surprise. And it's actually the opposite that's happening. McLaurin said he's not going to be singularly in this position, but guess what's happened in the two games. It's the only place you've seen him line up. They have said they are going to be a much more diverse offense that leans on the run, and yet they ran a no-huddle offense exclusively in a game just to do it. Not to show the league that this is what they... They don't plan to be the run and shoot and try to run 100 plays a game. They're just trying to do it. And so I just... I found this laughable. And I almost wanted to say something to Ben because I'm like, you know better than this than to tweet this out because this person clearly isn't following along at all. No, I mean, this is always the problem when somebody outside of the normal people that cover the team try to try to give you a, you know, stats based breakdown when they don't actually know what some of the storylines are. This isn't just preseason or training camp. This is for the regular season too. Like you need context for some of this stuff. It, It goes across with honestly any sport, but Specifically with football, you have no idea unless you're covering stuff day to day what's actually going on. I always like to joke about the Eagles fans last year that were, remember, they were freaking out and you and me were like, ah, they won 10 games. Like, how bad could they be? And it was like, well, day to day, we weren't covering them and they knew what was going on. Like, this is one of those scenarios where you're just pulling out stats to kind of argue for your narrative, argue essentially. Narrative. Yeah. Yes, argue a narrative. On the they're using less shifts that less shifts than everybody else. No kidding. They're not trying to show you what they're right. trying. That should have been the part, Ian, that stood out to you to go, wait a minute. Am I looking at something that's a carryover or are they just literally trying to do something to either throw us off or work on something specific? Because that's what's going on here. The last point that he brought up about RPOs. Well, look who our quarterback is. I mean, that's the one thing that I would think that it's not going to be a surprise. Everybody watched him play in college. Of course, there's going to be RPOs on the offense. There's no way there isn't going to be RPOs on the offense. So I would just say this, which goes back to what I saw. And granted, I'm there every day and that's all I'm doing. So when I read this, I'm like, this is preposterous. And then that's why I was like, when Ben tweeted it, I'm like, Ben, you know better than this. I don't know why you're tweeting this out. You know the purposes that they did with some of these things. And you know, because McLaurin's told you he is not going to be singularly in this one position. Why would you give any credence to a scouting report that literally has no idea what it's talking about? And then I saw today and I went, huh, I actually think I saw things that they're really going to do in games. And we're so close to closing the doors. DQ, Cliff, Wit, D- give it two more days. I know you're not running anything Sunday night. We don't need to see it, is the point. We don't, because everybody's guessing, including this person who has no idea what they're talking about. The advantage that they think they have is that people don't know what they're going to be. And I agree with that approach for at least the first few weeks. Let people not have the film on you. 
And I really believe they've gone out of their way on both sides of the ball to not let anybody have the film on them yet. Yeah. I mean, and there's, they shouldn't have that happen. I mean, we, we've referenced the two big things that have happened or the two big references of that happening with this franchise. One was Terry McLaurin rookie year when we were like, we haven't seen this guy play and he lights up the Eagles. And the other was the RG three offense. We had no idea what they were about to unleash. And they just go down to new Orleans and beat the saints that year. Like hundred percent with you. They shouldn't show anything and anyone saying anything different. Yes. You know, doesn't know ball it, is what this I would is say. Also annually you'll find this out. And I don't obviously don't bet on the NFL because not only can I not do it, but like <laughs> the more I'm around it, the more I'm like, the less I know I'd rather not even do it. But like, the first month of the season, you know nothing about anybody, really. Yep. Other than, right. you know, other than the Chiefs will be good, the Ravens will be good, the 49ers will be good, but they might not be great off the bat. Yeah. And there's other teams that, you know, may surprise you. And then things shift after a month. These guys need film on everybody because nobody knows what's coming early in the season. And that's why there's a lot of weird scores and weird upsets and some things you're like, what's going on right now? It all settles down after a month. And this team has gone out of its way to say to the NFL and everybody here loudly and proudly, we are not going to tell you what we're going to be because we want it to be a surprise. And it was funny going down to Miami last week because they're at a stage where they go, y'all know what we're going to do. We'll throw some wrinkles in, but we're just going to practice it because like, what's the point of trying to hide who we are? You got to try to beat us anyway. We're the best in the business. And I appreciated that because I watched it and I went, yeah, that's what you should be doing for training camp. I'm hoping in a few years, if Jaden is what I think he might be, we can do stuff like that. But for now, these preseason reports are preposterous, especially from people who aren't there at all or haven't paid attention to one press conference <laughs> the entire time. Preposterous. And just to, just to piggyback too off what you said with the Chiefs, but like the Chiefs are now the Patriots too. The Patriots would start off and not – be playing well and what do all the shows go with what's wrong with the Patriots it ha it's happened with the Chiefs two years in a row now and it's what's wrong with Mahomes and the Chiefs and it's like guys do you not get this anymore like they start off slow they figure everyone else out and when they get in you're not beating them essentially like that's right they have a uh, <laughs> hall of fame coaching and hall of fame quarterbacking yes in the end everything settles out yes right exactly in like, the end and I'm hoping we have that you know we can say that in a couple of years that's what I'm hoping we're going to be able to say and we'll, we'll find out yeah. all right the other thing that's going on now down there is everyone's starting to try to take guesses at what the roster is going to look like next week and there are a few spots that I do wonder what's going to end up happening here and I would start with these on offense do they keep four running backs do they keep four tight ends how many receivers then if either one of those is three and, or if they keep four, are they happy with six receivers? And who doesn't make it if that's the case. And now because they're playing around with kind of this position flex to a degree, like Kaz Allen's now a running back all of a sudden, it's like they're kind of messing around on the margins with the roster, trying to find, I think space for people and not lose everybody. So I'll start with running backs. I don't know that there's four that they have to keep is the way that I would look at it. Like we know who the top two are. They have to keep a third for sure. I don't know who that's going to be yet. If that's Kaz Allen, then I have a funny feeling they'll keep a fourth, like either McNichols, maybe this guy Wiley, maybe Rodriguez, albeit it feels like I'm making a harder and harder case for him to make the team. But I could see a case where if they don't keep Kaz Allen, that they only keep three because the reason they're keeping Kaz Allen is to have him be a returner mainly and a total change of pace type player. And then at tight end, I go, okay, I know Bates, Sinnott, Ertz are locks and heavily used players for this team. Do they have to keep Cole Turner? Do they have to keep this guy Yankoff, who I know they like a lot and want to develop? Are they actually concerned that if they put him on the open market, he would sign with somebody else? And I don't think that would be the case. I think he would get to the practice squad. But then that turns into how many receivers do you keep? And you can't then have Pringle and Crowder. If those are your two returners, that's impossible at this point. So I think we are in a spot where they're going to have to get creative, like really creative to try to keep all the things that they want, especially if they're earmarking 
people who don't do a lot other than these specialty things, I don't know how they're going to get around to 53 on offense that doesn't include making some, some real like tough decisions on a couple of guys and maybe not take the exact guy they wanted returning kicks or the exact guy returning punts because there's just not room for everybody at this point. I mean, I think right off the bat, I think it's going to be three running backs, three tight ends, and then it's going to be practice squad stashes. I mean, that's, that's how I think they're going to operate. Um, I think they could lose Cole Turner if they cut him. Okay. I don't think they would lose this other rookie tight end because he wasn't drafted in the first place. And and most of the time we always overvalue. Like I heard some people saying things like, uh, don't cut Sam Hartman. And I'm like, why? He was undrafted. <laughs> like no one's going to pick him up to be on the main roster. Yes. So he'd have to go to someone else's practice squad. Why would he do that? Why wouldn't he just stay here at that point? It wouldn't make any sense for him to do that unless he was going to be on a main roster. But who's picking him up to do that? So you don't worry about that. And this guy Yankoff, I know they like him a lot, but he went undrafted. It's not like it's not like I think he's like some valued asset that's going to get picked up and put on a main roster. So I think you can move him. Turner's different though. He's played a little bit. He's got size. If a team is really short on tight ends, I think that's risky if you put him out there. Yeah, but this always goes down to like we talked about this last year. I forget which position group we talked about last year where if you're down to Cole Turner actually playing Oh, yeah. you're kind of screwed like I, I mean like this is where it gets really cynical talking about the roster like same thing with running back if we're getting down to the third running back because Eckler and Robinson are hurt we're kind of packing it in anyways like this is just where this is just where the roster it gets it like I feel like everyone overthinks it essentially is and yeah where, this like is everyone, Ian's going you are so in the weeds it's ridiculous yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes <laughs> exactly and so that's why I think three running backs, three tight ends is fine. And then I think they just – they don't know what they have in the wide receiver room, and that's where I think it's going to kind of bulge. Just, I think they're going to keep more wide receivers because they don't quite know what the mixture should be. So, If Kaz Allen stays, I think Crowder's in trouble. Okay. If Kaz Allen goes to the practice squad, I think Crowder makes the team because he's definitively going to be the primary punt returner at that point. Um, but then I look at the receiving core and I go – Okay, I mean, I guess Terry Zacchaeus is a is a vet, um, but McCaffrey is not. Diami, let's wait and see. I think how it fits there. Do you feel better having a veteran like Crowder or Pringle around on the if we need to turn to a veteran at some point because we just don't feel like everyone's on the same page and we just don't want somebody who's been around the block? I think you have to think about that. Like this is not this is not their best group. I think it's a deep group. I think it's potentially a pretty good group, but it's not what the bears are throwing out there. Yeah. So do you feel like, are we relying too much on a couple of younger guys? Do we need to have a couple veterans there on the just in case? And that's an interesting thing to think about. And with Crowder too, honestly, like because you can put veterans on the practice squad and it's expanded, you can always keep him around unless he, he's another one that if he, gets put out there, and then all of a sudden someone goes, I need a punt returner, he might get picked up. It's yeah. Possible. No, exactly. I mean, that's the risk that you run. But same thing. Like, it's it's one of those things. If you don't think you have someone better than him, then he should be on the roster, and that ends up you end up eating that mistake in the end anyways. Yes, you do. So we'll see how it goes. I think they got – I think I'm on them. I don't see any weird decisions coming down the road. Yeah. But – some tricky ones for sure at least on that side of the ball and maybe we'll talk a little bit more about the defense soon all right let me take a quick break for everybody's show he's been 6 30 all right this episode is brought to you by experian are you paying for subscriptions you don't use but can't find the time or energy to cancel them Experian could cancel unwanted subscriptions for you, saving you an average of $270 per year and plenty of time. Download the Experian app. Results will vary. Not all subscriptions are eligible. Savings are not guaranteed. Paid membership with connected payment account required. Welcome back. Brave Watch the show ESPN 630, the sports capital. Um, so the news is already out there again. I think this was Sports Business Journal. 
I don't pay for a subscription to them, so I couldn't read the whole thing. So I'm just oh, I taking have it. I should have sent it to you. Yeah. Okay. You want to <laughs> you you give me the highlights outside of I read the first paragraph before it gets blurred out, you know, for yeah. not being a, a subscriber that basically was like Muriel Bowser has already hired a consultant, paid whatever amount of money for the consultancy. And the consultancy was to help the city figure out how they're going to build the stadium how they're going to fund the stadium. And so they brought in what seems to be more about a financial expert for city planning than a, you know, it's up to the team to bring in an architect. It's up to the city to figure out how to do this. And it's just another sign of, I think we all know where this is going, assuming the federal government's going to play along, but we're creeping. It's just another sign. We're creeping a little bit closer. They're going to spend whatever it was, a half million dollars, bringing in a consultancy to explain to them how to find some kind of bond loophole or tax loophole to make this actually happen because the ownership, as much as they want to go back to RFK, they're not going to foot the whole bill. I think everybody knows that. And considering how much money they just gave Ted and how they often tell everybody that they're broke, um, it's going to be an interesting sell of how they're going to get around to. And, oh, by the way, we gave the commanders a billion dollars to build this, whatever it's going to cost to do it. Because I've seen the price tags on these other stadiums and other cities. I mean, we're talking about a $2 billion project of which half of which I would assume the city is going to, you know, foot at least to make this happen. So how do they get around to that? I don't know. It's above my pay grade. But it is another sign that we're heading in that direction again. Uh, so the Cliff Notes version of all of it was it's not just how they're going to pay for it. It's going to be how that land gets turned over. It's the amount of jobs that get held. The number that they put on the story was 2,095 stadium jobs plus a whole other mess of construction jobs. Mm-hmm. Then it was also um, – Yeah, the, Ted tried to do that too. In fairness, yeah. Ted's sitting there going sure. – Ted went, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You guys you guys got on me about those job numbers when I was talking yeah, to Louise about it. But remember Ted's job numbers were ridiculous? Like, it was a ridiculous number. We're all going, huh? Like, 2,000 jobs for a stadium actually doesn't sound crazy. For an NFL stadium, that sounds about right, actually. Yes, but, you know, like, and, and in fairness, too, and if anyone's sitting, not that I'm, like, caring about the, you know, this part of it, but – those jobs are for specific dates of a year, not all year. Sure. Yeah, yeah, totally. I get <laughs> you know, you. but like we're we're not talking about this. Like this isn't Amazon HQ coming in yes. here where we've got all these full time jobs that show up here. I'm not dismissing this. They're jobs and they're important, and I want people to work. But it's it's you know ten Sundays, guys. You know, like outside of whatever else ends up coming into a brand new stadium, which I would assume would be a lot of entertainment events for sure. Right. So. It went into the details of the jobs, the logistics of those jobs, too, of like how that all works, like back of house type things was in there as well. What I actually found the most interesting, because I'm not breaking any news here. It's a consulting company. This is what they're supposed to do. What I found interesting was they are due. That contract is due to end September 30th. So they got a month and 10 days here to literally did it say how long they've been under contract with them it Has it been months it didn't but it said September you don't hire 30th. somebody for that kind of money for a month or two so they've probably been working behind the scenes sure. with the city government probably thinking that the federal government would have passed the bill by now but your boy danny danes had to hold things up with the family in wyoming i don't know whether that's been settled or not because i haven't heard anything about it i do know that hasn't gone back into committee yet They are also on like, you know, we're in convention season, so you're not hearing about anything that's happening on Capitol Hill. And we're TikTok, TikTok. I mean, the reality is it's not the election that's the deadline because everyone stays in office until January. But come January, if the balance of power is shifted on those committees or there is a different president, the presidency, well, there's going to be. But I mean, like if there's going to be a different party in control, then you don't know what's going to happen with the land. So- The clock is ticking here. I mean, they've got September, October, November. They got four months. But the reality is like nothing's going to happen in and around the actual election. So you lose whatever that is. And then if it doesn't happen before Christmas, it's over. And then if everybody is still in the same positions that they're in, dependent on the results of the election, maybe it just gets picked up at a later date and maybe not. So 
the clock is ticking here for this to have, at least for the federal government to do their part to allow this to happen. But this was just another sign of we're ready. We have a game plan. We plan to explain to Tom Sherwood how we're going to do this. And, you know, whether he buys it or not, we'll see. But they're trying, I mean, it is their way of saying, we got to have creative financing. We don't have the money to just throw a billion dollars at something. We're going to have to figure it out. There was mention in the story, though, about the same obstacles you mentioned. Danes was mentioned, but he was very throwaway in the article. They, they didn't think that was a legitimate threat. But they did mention, of I mean, course. I would hope not. Right. Um, they did mention uh, Van Hollen, though, for Maryland, that yes. he's the one that's like, he has Maryland in his best interest. Um, and that he's was the bigger one of, problem here. Yes. Correct. Actually. He's so, trying to stand in the way. Yes. And he's just trying to do what he believes is right by his governor and his constituency. And I right. don't, I have no issue with that. So, I, you know, hope that it doesn't actually totally thwart the whole thing, but I understand the positioning he's going to take for his constituency. I understand that. Yeah. But uh, my argument for the whole thing though, was like, Van Holland, you got Maryland uh, voters that do want it in D.C. So, like, watch out. Like, watch out what 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 tree you go up there, pal. Like, right. you might lose some voters in your own state because you're trying to do the better thing. But what my kind of conclusion was on this was this is this is not unlike Jaden Daniels winning the starting job. He had to check boxes, right? The D.C. government. I feel like we've been checking these boxes for 20 years. <laughs> Yeah, but Dan Dan burned all of the boxes. So there were no boxes for years. Yeah, now that, now Muriel that they, didn't want to meet with him at the hotel and have <laughs> discussions with him. Correct, yes. And so now, new ownership, the papers are back. The papers got slid across the table. And this is box number one. You've got to research all of this because it's an important... It, you and I have said this many times before too. The city should have control of the land, right? Period. Yes. So this is the whole thing. It's a very important parcel of land in a city now that there's really not an inch of land to build things anymore. So they're doing exactly what they need to do and researching what they need to to see what they get out of it if yes. they were to do this. Okay, so I was thinking about this. I read this today and I was having a conversation with, I think it was George Wallace, WTOP. We were talking about this. And I like, see if you think I'm nuts. I had an idea here. All right, so let, let's just go down this road that RFK gets the stadium back. And we'll yes. see where the training facility is, whether it stays in Virginia where it is, goes somewhere else, goes to Maryland, whatever. But it's not the stadium, okay? Yep. And Maryland, you know, openly says they have the money. They would like to do a stadium again with the commanders. Does it make any sense to then shift the funds over to the University of Maryland and give them a world-class stadium? No. Why not? Have they warranted that? No, but I think that they cannot compete at the levels that they would at least attempt to compete at unless they did. And Bird, I think, is a problem, or whatever they're calling it now. I think, is a pro I think it's a problem. And I go over there and I look at these football facilities, and they're world-class. They're amazing. They're the best football facilities I've ever been in. And then you walk into their stadium, and it's a mess. And I agree with you that they haven't necessarily warranted, at least from wins and losses, the perspective, like the money. However, if they're trying to divert these types of funds and build a world-class stadium literally on the edge of Washington, D.C. to, you know, have major sports going on right outside the city in the state and then potentially lure all of these different events that can occur – it somewhat makes sense to me that Maryland ought to consider that. And, you know, maybe the people at the university are psyched. I'm saying it, but like it's overdue that they get a stadium that could compete in the big 10 because they don't have one currently, in my opinion. And I don't think it's a lure and I don't think they have a good tailgating experience. And I think <laughs> if they want to actually try to really be competitive in the big 10 and in college football in general, I think that's where it starts actually for me. It's not in the training facility. It's in a home stadium that people actually want to go to and revere and like and potentially would want to support. You're so far gone from what they are, though. Like, th this is the problem here. I've told you this before. My generation doesn't care. And it would take <laughs> years and years. It would take decades to build that back up. They're not unlike what this organization is, the commanders. 
until they show you that they are competent and that they're going to compete, you know, consistently here, why would you hand them a state of the art stadium? Well, I mean, like, well, you could say that about the commanders. They have been in the playoffs like three times over the last 20 right. years. Like, but they're getting a new stadium. No one's even thinking twice about something like that. Because one, they have new owners now. Yeah. The other owner was the worst owner in all of sports. And two, it's the NFL. It prints money. Even the worst team in the league prints money. Let me see. Well, because Cleveland's getting a brand new stadium. They actually told, they were like, we looked into it and we'd like the really expensive new one, actually, guys. <laughs> what we like. Yes. And they tried right. to say that like really nicely. Like, you know, we looked into the other one, but I think we're just going to do that. And they're going to get it because everybody gets it. But I had an idea about this, and I'm like, I'll run this by you. You think I'm nuts? Okay. Yeah, I will. <laughs> what if the stadium looked like a giant turtle? <laughs> <laughs> Just what if it did? <laughs> what if the facade of it looked like a giant turtle shell? I mean, that's great, but like, it's incredible. Are you kidding? It's incredible. What do you call in that stadium? I don't know. I don't know. But, like, imagine that, like, kind of half roof or whatever it is, and it looks like a turtle shell, and the outside looks like a turtle shell, and his little feet are, like, at the corners of all of it. There's a head sticking out of it. Come on. Like, you want to make a statement. That would be amazing. And since Wes is going to spend the money on a stadium, he's willing to spend the money on a stadium, and he wants to do something in this area, like near D.C., it just occurred to me that Maryland should have one. And if they had one, do the coolest thing you've ever seen. Make it look like a giant turtle shell. Um, one, I don't disagree with you. It would be cool. Okay, let's just, let's just, let's say that. It would be cool. But once again, I don't trust this organization with that though and how big are you making the stadium or how small are you making this stadium i'm thinking like this is this is like a 50 60 000 seat See, i disagree i go you go less i think Fine. you make it 40. 45 max. 40 throw a dome on it make it small make it easy to get to yeah. Forty thousand people if they can't fill that <laughs> useless right if you can't fill that this is what i'm getting at like this is what i'm getting at though like i don't know if that if that many people care about Maryland football in the area to go to every game. Oh, see, I feel like though, if they had a proper modern stadium with a proper kind of like setup where you could tailgate and actually make the experience like worthwhile, I actually think people would start to go more often. Honestly, like if it was a great experience, I think people would go more often. Now, Will they ever be able to compete with the Penn States and the Michigans and the Ohio States? Like, it's hard to see it. But when I look at what they have now, like, I love this football facility. They don't have tradition. They got a bad stadium. The in-stadium experience isn't great. And, you know, it happens every year. They start 2-0 and and everyone shows up, you know, in black or whatever. <laughs> and then they lose to Iowa 45-3 to and then no one goes again. Well, at least if they had a great stadium experience... I actually think people would be more willing to be on board with it, with the ups and downs that exist. And then who knows, maybe you actually start to build some momentum with their alums and their fan base. But I think it starts with a new stadium now, actually. I think they I have think it backwards. It should have been a stadium, not the football facility, but you know, whatever, it's too late now. Yeah. I mean, it would take years and years to build that up because I just don't think the demand is there. And I think you, you are understating though, Maryland in the grand pantheon of DMV activities. Like, you know how this is in this area. I agree. It's an event town. None of those are events. Now, some Terps basketball games are. And like, but, that's, you know, that's what I'm getting at. I agree. But keep in mind now with football, with the Big Ten and the SEC basically being the two conferences, they got USC coming here. Like, most of the games are going to be big brand games here now. Like, most of them are. Calm Most down there. Calm down every there, other Abe. year, they're going to get Penn State or Michigan. Every other year, they're going to get Ohio State. Like, every other year, they're going to get Oregon or USC. Like, it's big brand football now that's coming in here. Like, the schedule is going to be outrageously good. Like, calm, calm down event. there. Calm down there, Bram Poland. 
you know, uh, hyping up the teams that are coming in here. Are you kidding me with this? What is this? Like, it's where I have to be at this point. Let, <laughs> Look, the Clippers have stunk forever. They just built a two billion dollar arena with a lot of toilets in it. <laughs> well, I mean, they're trying. They're trying something completely different, but they're also in a league where if you're the second fiddle in your city, they still print money. Yeah, like, that's I, I would just say at. this: at this point in college football, if you're part of the Big Ten or you're part of the SEC, you're part of the in crowd, and and everyone else is the out crowd. I mean, like, so Maryland needs to start acting like it if they're going to be in this. Maryland's been in the Big Ten for a decade, and we're still hyping up. Well, Michigan's coming. Ohio State's coming. Let's go see them. Like, well, I mean, you got to do what you got to do. You got to sell tickets. You got to sell tickets. What, what do you call them? Lay Terps? Lay Terp ends? Oh, is that what we're calling them now? Come yeah. see the Instead other opponents? Being, what is it? With Tony used to say like 7-11 or 7-18 yeah. <laughs> or whatever it was. They're always 3-1, and one, and yes. that's when it's going to go. <laughs> Every All year. Right. But you have to admit, though, if it looked like a giant turtle shell, come on. Yeah, I mean, good. yeah, that's cool. But like, you know, that's mm-hmm. that that's cool after you've had fifteen drinks and at you know at the VU. So, you know, Everything how realistic? Cool after you've had fifteen drinks at the VU, <laughs> right? So, how realistic is that? It's not. All right, let me take a quick break. Ray wants to show he's being six thirty in sports capital. All right, welcome back. Very much to show ESPN 630, the sports capital. All right, um, so I saw this pop up recently, and this is, uh, there's a Kirk Cousins birthday practice playlist that was uh, put out by the Atlanta Falcons. Among the songs that are on this list, Mr. Brightside, so all the Caps fans are pumped, Kirk, for that one. Uh, Stacy's mom is on this as well. Great seemingly very white guy song kryptonite by three doors down that's on as well so what do you think of kirk's playlist uh i saw this earlier and i like it kirk going full kind of 2000s you know pop rockish. what i'm gonna say here kirk sold out there's no creed on that list and we okay. know he loves creed so and i got so, a twist for you there's okay. a twist for me. all right as it turns out Kirk didn't make this list. The Uh, Falcons made the list and suggested these are the songs we think Kirk would like. Kirk apparently uh, sent a message to Kyle Brandt of NFL Network and said, that's not my playlist. Yes. There you go, Kirk. There you go. He had to do PR and damage control. That's what that's what Senator Cousins does. He makes sure that that he gets the info out there. What would he be more mad about at this point? that they're tweeting out music he might like or that they selected Michael Pettix. <laughs> uh, music that he might like. Cause that's, I agree. His, Cause that's, I a, don't that's... think Kirk shies away from competition. I think Kirk's like, go ahead, bring Whatever. some rookie in here. I don't care. You gave me guaranteed money, but like on the, on the set list, we saw this firsthand. Kirk's running around singing the music he likes. Don't tell me what I like guy. No, and, and Kirk, you got to remember, he's Senator Cousins. He has a very specific image that he wants to be thrown out there. That's and right. so I think for him, it was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I did not put this out there. Do not, I do not sing Stacy's Mom. This is a Christian household. We do not sing like that Stacey's song. Mom. Right. See, that was a big miss. You all know what that song's about, right? Yeah. <laughs> right. right. That's not Kirk. That's not Kirk. Yeah, yeah. No. Uh, like, come on. Anyone that knows Kirk is not, not looking at Stacy's mom that way. He might go with Stacy's mom to church. He might go to Stacy's mom to the potluck dinner. He might go with Stacy's mom to make s'mores in his backyard fire with his kids. <laughs> but he's not going with Stacy's mom the way that that song intends anybody goes with Stacy's mom. And I would say this too. There are two, there were two musical pieces of Kirk when he was mic'd up with the Redskins. It was him singing Creed and him saying that he loved Hamilton. So you have a guy that likes Creed and likes musicals. And, and he remember, he was in musicals in high school, too. There's those clips going out there. Yes. So I'm just saying. Well, he Falcons, sang at the NFL Awards last year. Yeah, that too. Yeah. So I'm, I'm just saying, the Falcons, they failed on that one. That was a bad look. Bad look. I, got a, I got a hot take on Hamilton. I don't think it's going to age well. I think you're wrong. I think you're totally really? dead wrong on that. Yeah, you're dead wrong. I think the songs are going to end up feeling... 
I love, listen, I love that. I love it. But I have a feeling like at some point, someone's going to wake up and go, they rapped about Alexander Hamilton. Something's not right with all of that. I think you're dead wrong. It's 10 out of 10. It melds theater and rap, which hasn't really been done like that. And you're wrong. You're, you're I, wrong yeah, on that one. I don't know, though. I'm, I'm going to hold on to this one. Mark this one down. Hot take. I think at some point people are going to look at that and it might be cats. Like, I think it's it's possible. I think it's possible. I mean, you still got Mamma Mia all over the place, too, dude. Like, yeah, but you Mama think- Mia is a musical about, you know, a woman with three men, all of which might be the father of a daughter. And, and it's, the all music- ABBA. it's all yeah. ABBA. And it's all ABBA. And it's survived. Yeah, but this what? isn't like, those songs weren't written by Snoop Dogg. <laughs> like, that's, that's the problem here. I don't know. We'll see. I love Hamilton now. I just have a funny feeling it's not going to age well, that people are going to make fun of it at some point. That's so what wait, I think. The- the musical with the Swedish pop group apparently is still timeless, though. It's 2024, Abba playa. Abba's, Abba's timeless. I, I hate know, to break it. Abba's no, no, timeless. But I'm it's not like, it's like, it'd be like, if you looked at, if I turned the music off and you just watched Elvis jump around and gyrate on stage, you might go, what the hell was that? <laughs> you know, like, but, and like, and I told you, like, this was for a long period of time the most famous musician in the world. You know, I think like some young people would be like, if you just didn't play the music, you'd be like, what are you talking about? But when you hear it, it's timeless. It's timeless. And I think ABBA is timeless. Nobody sounds like them. They're timeless. This Hamilton stuff, I don't know that it's going to go down as like the greatest music that's ever been made. So we'll see. Don't get mad at me, Lin-Manuel. I love your play. I've seen it actually live multiple times. So don't hate me for it. I just have a funny feeling that this is not going to age particularly well. I think you're wrong because I think it's actually what you're underselling what Hamilton is. And I think it's a gateway for people to watch theater that normally don't watch theater or Broadway. And that's actually what it's, it's, I think it's become is people that go, Oh, I don't like Broadway. And then they watch this, they go, Oh, this is really cool. And all of a sudden it opens the door to them. I think you're underselling what it does. Okay. So like schoolhouse rock in a way, like it opens the door kids because they like it maybe i may uh, maybe something like that but i think like you look at people because then what happened with hamilton too is it was like you could you could try hating it but so many people liked it it became like oh like well then you've never watched it or you've never listened to it. i didn't like it i did I no did. no totally i'm, I, I get I'm that. in the i'm of the I don't know if this is going to age like it's like certain sitcoms like they're incredible at the time and then at a later date you're like why was that popular like I'm yeah not- but you know how this works too. Well, I watch the reruns of Friends now, and I'm kind of like, it wasn't that funny. Like, <laughs> I don't know why people thought it was, but they did. I I would say this though: music age is completely different than sitcoms. Though sitcoms are pretty much used cars. The second they're put out, they have a half life. Essentially, they're they're descending fast. Music, but, you you actually don't know. Well, because they're also typically of the culture at the moment. Yes, and so everything about it ages poorly. That's no right. one dresses that way. They often don't speak to each other that way. And Technology. The, joke, the jokes could be cancelable. You know, really all those Correct. things. Correct. Anyway. All right. Uh, we'll talk to you tomorrow. For everybody to show you, it's 630s for Catholic.